All right. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. Um, as you may know, I'm Rob Wiblin. Uh, I host the podcast over at 80,000 Hours. Please like and subscribe and tell a friend. Uh, today, I'm joined by Michael and Kelsey. Uh, Michael, uh, since 2017, has led Open Phil's work on communications, uh, including uh, interactions with the news media. And in the past, he's worked in the press, a think tank, the California government, and a range of charities and foundations. Uh, Kelsey Piper has been a staff writer for Vox's Vertical focused on effective actress themes for the last two years. Um, she, in the past, has blogged at the Unit of Caring and ran Stanford Effective Altruism during her college years. Thanks for joining both of you. Nice hey, you. Thanks. So for this session, I was initially uh, thinking of giving a presentation on good and bad use of jargon and actually ended up writing a full presentation, which you can find in the links in the session. We decided not to present it here, but I thought I'd share, I'll just take one snippet from that uh, and share a couple of pieces of jargon that I think that I hate and that I think we could mostly do away with. And uh, maybe then I could ask, ask you two for examples of any jargon that you particularly despise. Uh, so for me, I think, uh, when it, when I solicited lots of examples on social media of, uh, of, example of, uh, of jargon that, uh, that people were keen to do away with. Um, and some of the ones that I think are best are an order of magnitude, why don't you just say 10 times, 10 times big, it's an order of magnitude bigger, it's 10 times bigger, everyone understands 10 times, most people don't understand an order of magnitude. Ontology is another one, I've been hearing that for years, I still don't really know what an ontology is. Uh, utility, can't we just say well-being in almost every case, okay, unless you're doing actual philosophy, whenever do you need to say utility when you can say well-being? Um, update, why don't you say change your mind, people know what change your mind is. Epistemic status, confidence level maybe. Um, inferential distance, it's like, they don't know enough to understand it. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of terms that we sometimes throw around uh, internally that uh, then get exposed to the broader world and uh, then people just get massively confused for no particularly good reason. Uh, did you guys have any uh, examples of jargon, uh, speaking of communication that uh, you're not keen on? Okay. Uh, so I, I thought- Michael? Uh, particularly hard to access. I, I've never quite mastered uh, the the use of those terms, and so I, I, that's one that I thought is you know maybe good for an internal audience, but is not broadly comprehensible. And so I, that was one that I that I had in mind. Um, you can actually kind of broke up there. I actually didn't didn't catch that. Ah, sorry. Inside view and outside view. Inside view. That, okay. Yes. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah. In the presentation, I had that as an example of a piece of jargon that is like valuable enough concepts that they're worth explaining, but you do actually have to explain them. Otherwise, it's just hugely confusing. Exactly. One experience I've had at Vox is I've written up a study and I've said like, I'm really unconvinced by their significance testing here. There's multiple comparisons. I just don't buy it. And my editor was like, this is getting into the weeds. It's it's going to off put readers. And I was like, what? That's That's very straightforward way of explaining that and so it was worth getting a reminder that to most people as soon as you dive into statistical concepts and stuff like that they're confused they're a little on edge they're worried that they don't understand this stuff and you have to be very patient and if you're like treating that as obvious then you lose a lot of people who are maybe perfectly capable of learning that but didn't start out knowing it Nice. All right. Well, the theme of the session is, I guess, communicating effective altruist ideas. Uh, and I guess we've taken it in the direction of communicating them to the, to the broader world. Um, I think in the notes for the session, we all agreed that I think that uh, a key part of communicating well is being able to model or <laughs> being able to understand how people are going to respond to the different things you say, being able to put yourself in their head, which is actually incredibly difficult a lot of the time. Um, but Kelsey, you've been writing at Vox for a couple of years now. Do, do you do anything to kind of make sure that you can keep an accurate model of the reader so that, and have some ability to anticipate how they're going to respond to the things you're saying and what they will and won't understand? So one thing that we do a lot of is our newsletters. Often we ask for a response from people, and that's sort of valuable to hear how people are reacting to the things you've said and what their objections are and just which parts of your articles they're finding unsatisfying or particularly compelling. I think there's really no way to keep an audience in mind without talking to that audience and engaging with that audience. Um, when I blogged, I mostly wrote about EA topics by answering questions that specific people put to me. And I think that's really underrated as a way of doing communications. If you're answering a specific question someone asked, then you know Know you're answering something they didn't know and wanted to know and reached out to you for your answer. And it's very easy to keep in mind your audience when your audience is in some sense a specific person who had a question. And of course, more than that specific person. Um, but I think a lot of communications benefits from having in mind a 
like an actual back and forth with the audience that shaped your understanding of what they understood and what they didn't understand. Yeah, when, when I heard on the grapevine, when, when I heard on the grapevine that you uh, learn a lot about the audience from uh, the replies to the, to the newsletter, I started replying to every single one of them to try to push you in the direction <laughs> of writing kind of stuff that I like. <laughs> oh, Michael, Michael, what were you gonna say? I would strongly endorse the idea of talking with, you know, regularly talking with your audience to, you know, continue to refine the model that you have of who you're writing for, who you're talking to. And so when I'm talking to people and they ask me about open philanthropy, I, I am constantly like sharing a revised version of, you know, the elevator pitch or the, you know, the 30 second version. And I'm, I'm sort of like paying attention to what lands what you know what resonates what doesn't what people get excited about what they don't and i'm using that to inform how i talk to others i'm taking sort of each conversation as an opportunity to learn about what different audiences are, are going to respond to in terms of what we're saying i guess who who is your audience from who's open phil's audience so I'm thinking it might be kind of hard to actually get to meet them or chat to them very often yeah yeah i mean so we, we have a few different audiences that actually are quite different from one another uh but the the three that i think of sort of as our primary audiences are the people whose partnership we need to have the impact in the world that we want to have, right? If we're mostly giving money away uh, to accomplish good, we want people, we want, you know, grantees who are happy to receive that money. So we're sort of our existing grantees and prospective new grantees. We want people who will work, will work at OpenFill to help us give away the money. And so we're looking for, you know, our current staff, but especially potential future staff members. And then we're talking about funders. You know, at this point, it's mostly Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz who are uh, we're, we're advising giving their money away. In the future, we might expand that to include others. And so we're thinking about prospective future donors as a, a key audience. And so they're quite different from one another in terms of what they're looking for. And in some ways, we have to hold these different audiences in our head simultaneously. And you might speak quite differently to one than you would to the other. And there's a sort of an element of code you're talking to and what you want them to understand about you. Yeah, right. you got to keep the millionaires and billionaires on board. Um, Kelsey, are there any expressions over the last few years that you've learned uh, go down like a lead balloon with your audience or like expressions that are particularly useful that you find yourself turning to all the time because they kind of just hit the nail on the head in terms of explaining something difficult? Hmm, I don't know about specific expressions, but an experience I have a lot is that people who have vaguely heard of a topic, um, some things you'll say, they'll sort of match to what they already heard about the topic, and then they'll end mm. up walking away a little confused. So a lot of what you want to do is convey that you have something new to say, that it's not something that has previously been said, but that you're aware of the things that they've previously seen said. Um, so if they've already read like bad aid and criticisms of global charity in Africa, then you want to be talking in a way that communicates that you've read those critiques too. You think that those critiques are limited or unpersuasive in a particular area or don't apply to the organizations that you're talking about. Um, you, you want to make sure that the thing you're saying is in conversation with the viewpoints they already have. And in the case of global development, the things I found it like most important to be in conversation with are, yeah, blanket critiques of aid um, from, from the perspective of it never works or becomes a tool of US imperialism or things like that. Um, beliefs okay. that were addressing only symptoms and not the root problem, that's something where you want to communicate in a way that suggests, yeah, I've heard that critique. I don't think that's applicable to, you know, seasonal malaria chemo prevention or whatever. Um, with animals, I think you're talking around um, the general vegan argument, which I think lots of people have been exposed to in a weak form and found unpersuasive, which is something like it is never moral to use animals for anything. Um, and often once you distinguish what you're lots of other things about animals. Um, you can make that point distinct from points about veganism or that they've previously heard. Um, with climate change, there's a lot of like perspectives that people have previously heard about climate change. And I often find that talking about climate change is a matter of navigating, you know, both um, claims that it's the most important issue and <laughs> claims that it's all, you know, 70 corporations and not the fault of consumers or something we can do anything about anyway, and claims that uh, we're going to solve it all um, with technology or clean energy and claims that it's going to annihilate life on earth. Um, so I think you find an area and then you map out what have people already heard? What am I saying that's new and builds on their knowledge? And how do I make it clear to them right away 
that I'm building on their knowledge because you want to respect people's time. Um, and if they think that you're saying something they've already heard, then they are entirely right to not listen to you and to go do something else. So you need to convey right away that you're not saying something they've already heard. Yeah, I think another aspect of that is uh, you, you often want to be clarifying what you're not saying because if you, if what if something you are saying is is adjacent to something else that they've heard that you don't believe people are naturally going to think, oh, well, this, this sentence includes all these words that were made in a similar point that I've heard before. And so maybe they're saying that. And that, that, could, be, that could be frustrating as a speaker because you're like, but I'm not saying, I never said the thing that, you, that you're accusing me of saying or that you're assuming I'm saying. But it's kind of, I think it's a natural way that people like, because, especially because we've all got so much to pay attention to. We've only got so much brain power to focus on anything. A natural thing to do is like, look at the words and be like, probably what were they saying based on things that I've heard before. So being extremely clear about what clarifying, cutting out all of the space of things that you're not claiming that they might guess that you are uh, is, is, is really good. Yeah, do you have anything to, to add on that, Michael? No, I think that um, an adjacent point that, that occurs to me in hearing Kelsey talk about, you know, trying to figure out what they already know is, uh, you know, in communications, which has a similar, uh, you know, sort of goal in some ways to draw somebody where they are and help move them along to, you know, where they might be. And so having a pretty good idea of what they already believe helps me refine my argument so that it lands for them strongly. And so um, I think Kelsey's coming at it a little bit more to inform them to make clear that this is something that you didn't already know. I know what you knew already. This is in addition to that. I might be thinking about it a little bit more in terms of persuasion or opening their eyes to something or something subtly different from just, in, you know, informing. Um, but the same type of mentality of like, we're trying to like assess where they're coming from. What do you already you know? What is your current position? And then finding the adjacent spot on the path that they can walk to eventually get to something that, you know, would be closer to what I, I would hope that they would believe about, about an issue or about our work on an issue. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the effective autism community as a whole has a lot of views and often conflicting views on different things. Um, and I guess we have a way of thinking about things that is sometimes a little bit difficult to impart because there's just so many different tools that we use when we're thinking. And it's not always the same way that people are usually taught to think at high school or university. Are there any kinds of content that you think as a community we should be producing a lot more of in order to better explain ourselves and how we think to the, to the world? I guess Kelsey first. Yes, I absolutely think that. I think lots of other intellectual movements that use a set of unusual tools um, have a bunch more standard like courses where you learn it or clubs where you learn it or just a lot of routes for people to pick up the norms within an academic field. There's lots of norms about how we think in this field, how we write papers in this field, how we like make intellectual contributions in this field. And it would be good for more of that to exist for us. Um, there are a lot of essays, many of them are sort of old and out of date and people don't stumble across them naturally and it would be good to be refreshing that content and putting it out regularly. Um, I think it would be good for forums like the EA forum to be more active and a place where more people who are getting newly involved in EA post and Answer, get questions answered. Um, and I would be excited about us expanding it onto mediums like YouTube. Um, I think a lot of people have successfully conveyed very complex worldviews via making lots of videos which people watch. Um, and it would be really great if there were someone doing that for EA. Unfortunately, I can't do it myself because I don't have an attention span for watching videos. Um, <laughs> so I, I always read the transcript. It makes me the wrong person for this. But if somebody told me they were doing that, I would say, give, I, I'm so excited that that's happening. Yeah, I think the, the reason the YouTube thing hasn't happened, well, I mean, I love explainer videos. I love half as interesting Wendover, so real engineering, all of that stuff. I think the reason it hasn't happened is it's just so much bloody work to make these videos. I think they spend, you know, weeks and weeks making just 10 minutes. I guess that, that's one angle you can go is these like very honed content that explains difficult concepts really well. Another one is like the really cheap content on mass. So like having just conversations between people like this, where it's like people gradually uh, get the picture and we haven't really had to do almost any work at all. Um, <laughs> Do you have a view on the trade-off between those two things? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, I think Kelsey and I probably have a slightly different perspective on this. And I think it comes from where we sit in the community. But I, you know, and reaching out to audiences that we don't already know or don't already know us. And I, and I don't think that there's like a huge downside. I just think that it can be uh, costly 
and the you know the sort of the benefit does not pay it off in some cases. And so I tend to think of sort of like deepening connections with people who are already interested in these ideas and giving them a sort of like a ladder of engagement to, to walk or to climb to get in deeper once they've already expressed an interest or once they already are engaged in some way, as opposed to, you know, sort of broad based, um, more accessible for a wider audience uh, type content. But it's not that I think it's wrong, it's in terms of maybe I just sort of focus on my own use case that I'm thinking more about helping people you know, further along the path, get even deeper into it and get more excited and, and sort of make it their career or, you know, give in that way or, or things of that nature. Yeah, I think the comparison to an academic field sort of suggests the thing you just said there, where uh, teaching fairly a, a lot of information, a lot of worldview, a lot of tools for thinking about the world and about how to make arguments and how to engage with other intellectual work. the vague idea, lots of experts think we need to do something about AI, or lots of people are worried about factory farming. But I can't build on my previous writing at Vox enough to impart the, the deep knowledge that I think leads people to make new exciting intellectual contributions in EA. I think if I had to pick one, I would definitely say taking people who have some interest, you know, people with enough interest to log on to this EA Student Summit today and giving them the tools to make new intellectual contributions in EA, that seems more important to me. Everybody I know who's doing cool stuff in EA, um, you know, they heard about it and it, it almost, I wouldn't say it immediately drew them in, but there was an introduction to it that they found pretty inherently compelling and that sent them looking for more. Um, and of course, that's not gonna describe everybody, but it suggests to me that there's this big population of people who were sent looking for more and we want to make sure there's more to get them and to get them making big contributions. And that's more valuable than reaching, you know, 12 million people with a really good article about factory farming that'll make them all go, wow, yeah, that's kind of bad and not change. Very follow up. Um, but I still think there's value to if there were a YouTube channel that had millions of subscribers, um, that would be a good way to get people to get that first introduction that clicks for them and sends them looking for more. Um, and I think there can be things that are in a good space, both as mass outreach that lots of people read and as a hook or a building ground for people who've become more involved in the community. Um, so sometimes you can get both. Um, I would endorse that. That all makes sense to me. Um, you probably both had um, plenty of experience trying to explain what the hell effective altruism is uh, for the first time to someone, you know, family members, uh, colleagues, or uh, just other friends, friends that you know. Um, are there any particular ways that you uh, go about doing that in order to communicate it well or uh, pitfalls that you've uh, learned that you have to avoid? Uh, maybe Kelsey first? Um, so I think my elevator pitch for effective altruism has changed a lot over the past six years. Some of that has been honing for greater effectiveness, but some of it has actually been moving in the opposite direction where I felt like I had a very effective pitch that was nonetheless subtly wrong um, and not conveying what I really think the majority of EA work today is. And so then I tried to take a step back from that and you know, get something that's a bit more accurate to all of the work that we're doing. That made it harder because um, a lot of what we're doing is weird and making the elevator pitch case for something weirder is harder. But I think it's important that we don't communicate too well something that is made, <laughs> it, it made to be easy to communicate at the expense of, of being true about what's actually going on. Um, if I'm just talking to people and I'm just trying to make the conversation make sense, I end up talking a ton about all of our global development work. And I'm so proud of our global development work. I'm amazed by the stuff people have done there. I give them a lot of money. That's not misleading. But if somebody's trying to ask, what is EA? It's a lot more than that. So I ended up trying to get into a lot more depth about the stuff we do on AI, the stuff we do on the far future, the stuff we do on animals. And then coronavirus hit and it made this really easy for me because now my elevator pitch is, I wish we'd prevented the pandemic. There were people who were working on how we could have prevented the <laughs> pandemic. They didn't have enough money and damn it, they should have had enough money. And EA is not just that, but it is looking at lots of things like that, things that we can identify in advance. Lots of people saw the pandemic coming as areas that might really matter. And if we can make the work on them happen while they only might really matter, then we can stop them from ever 
reaching the stage where no amount of money and effort and research can prevent them from being devastating. Um, so now my, my elevator pitch for effective altruism looks a lot like that. It says, there's a bunch of people I know who were working last year on preventing the next pandemic. And I wish they had a hundred billion dollars. I wish that they had had a hundred billion dollars and tons of smart people with them. And I wish that the people in AI who say that their field has similar like major um, transformative challenges up ahead had that those resources. And I wish that the climate change people had those resources. And I wish that people worried about synthetic bio had those resources. Just everybody, who has a compelling case that there is a major transformative risk or change or development on the horizon, I, I, I want them to have the resources to make it go well. Um, so that's my elevator pitch today. Michael? Yeah, so that, that all makes a lot of sense. I agree that uh, for all its uh, you know, downfalls, the maybe one silver lining is that it, uh, of the pandemic is that it has <laughs> issues for a wider audience, right? These are sort of like uh, low likelihood high impact type things that most people might otherwise dismiss. Um, I think what you asked a little bit about pitfalls, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people think that their charitable giving uh, is effective, you know, and so it's, it's hard to differentiate effective altruism for people who, who don't quite know what you're talking about. And so I think the challenge is contrasting a little bit too starkly. And, you know, I, I know Peter Singer has talked about and, um, and possibly other, you know, EA groups have talked about, you know, that, you know, for the cost of one seeing eye dog in the United States, you can, you know, cure 40 people of blindness in sub-Saharan Africa or whatever it might be. And I think that's, that is a compelling argument, but you, you risk alienating people who are excited about the giving they're already doing. And so I think there's an important goal, in my opinion, of encouraging people to just give more, right? Just like more giving would be good. And and with sort of without feeling judged that like the thing they care about is dumb, right? I wouldn't want people to, to get the impression from EAs or from me that like, we think we're smarter than you. And if you only had a little bit more time to think harder, you would eventually get to where we are. And it's only that you're immature and like haven't thought very hard that you are where you are. I, I wouldn't want, that does not feel like a, an effective communication strategy because you're gonna turn people off before they can ever get interested in like the more effective thing to do or just like a different way of thinking, right? You want it to be, Sort of friendly and approachable and then when you get into deep into a deeper you see that there's uh some rigor to it and there are reasons why we've chosen the causes that we have um but but rob i i would turn the question around to you and ask have you seen any pitfalls and what have you found effective in, in giving people the elevator pitch yeah so the thing i usually do i've been on a, on a bunch of different shows and i have to often explain what what ea or eighty thousand hours is at the start Usually I give like a couple of sentences of the overarching theory, like effective altruism is using evidence and reason to do as much good as possible. But then I guess like Kelsey, I usually flip pretty quickly to examples. So it'll be like, for example, some people work on factory farming because they think it's very large, like there's a lot of animals and they're suffering a lot and not other people are working on it. So there's lots of great opportunities. And then there's other people who work on biosecurity because they think that it's more likely than other people realize and there's great work that can be done to solve it. So like demonstrate the principles more through examples. Uh, explaining like why people have made the choices to do what they're doing. I do worry though, I mean, I think for most people that the abstract idea of just like doing the most good to begin with, I think many people like don't even have the idea of like good as a like substance or something that you could produce more of the idea of this like quantifiable thing that you can have more or less of. Um, but uh, a lot of people like do get a bit lost in the abstract thing, but then I do wonder, sometimes I maybe go so hard on the examples that people then just think that it's what effective altruism is, is just a, this like particular series of things that I've listed rather than a series of principles about how you would make decisions. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? I guess we've got, only got 55 seconds left, but. Yeah, I do also have that problem that the examples are really important, but also I think there are underlying principles that produce the current EA focus areas and it you don't want the examples to seem random to people like there's a movement that cares about animals, pandemics, AIs, and malaria. <laughs> um, so a lot of what you want to do is, yeah, I think have material that both explains the basic principles and explains specific examples and fields and sort of lets people develop their interest maybe in an example and their interest in the broader underlying principles. Um, but you know, it's a hard problem. Communication is a really hard problem. Yeah, I guess I actually, um, I usually try to give, you know, one example that's involving politics and another example that's involving research, another actually uh, one that's involving direct work, you know, and like make sure that they're not too similar so that um, 
uh, people can get a sense that there's like a wide range of different things going on and it's not just you know a lot of political people but I suppose that could have the effect of making it just seem even more random and chaotic and <laughs> disjointed but I guess there are there, yeah there are trade-offs in doing these kind of things um, all right I guess un unfortunately we're out of time I suppose that's what happens when you've got three people to speak and only 25 minutes um, but yeah this is this has been a, a great pleasure and I hope that the audience got, got something out of it so uh, thanks so much Kelsey and thanks so much uh, Michael yeah, yeah thank you both of you if, uh, if people want to have a look at the uh, talk that I wrote about jargon, I think they can find it on, on the website on the, in, the, in the entry uh, for, the, for this event. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks so much for, for coming along uh, and uh, have, a, have a great evening.